Howdy folks, I'm Ben Starr. Welcome back to my kitchen. Today I am going to teach you how to bake a simple loaf of sourdough sandwich bread. I get a lot of people telling me that they bake my regular simple sourdough recipe in a loaf pan and use it for sandwiches. But my core simple sourdough recipe is a lean dough. It only contains flour, water, salt, and starter. And lean doughs do not make the best sandwich bread. Traditionally, sandwich loaves are made with a rich dough that has added fat and dairy to it. It gives it a slightly longer shelf life on your countertop and makes it nice, soft, rich, and yielding. Now, as you might expect, a rich dough is slightly more complicated than my simple sourdough recipe where you just stir four ingredients together and forget about it for a day. But it's only fractionally more effort, and I'm actually going to teach you a technique that might be mind-blowing if you've never run across it, but it adds several days of freshness to the loaf as it sits on the countertop so your bread doesn't stale quite so quickly. All right, let's get into it. Today we are weighing our ingredients with a scale as with all of my recipes. And if you don't have a scale, don't try to convert this recipe to measuring cups. Get yourself a scale. It is the only way to ensure consistency, especially for beginning bakers from loaf to loaf to loaf. My favorite scale is linked in the video description below, but any scale will do. And folks, today I am speaking in ounces. So for you metric folks, I'll have the conversions right there on the screen, as well as the written recipe that's in the video description below. Just click where it says more. Or you can go to my website, ultimatefoodgeek.com, and get a printable recipe for free right there. All right, we are starting with three ounces of flour. I am using all-purpose flour today. You can use bread flour if that's what you prefer to use. It will result in a slightly higher rise and a slightly chewier texture, which is definitely not something I want with my sandwich bread. I want my sandwich bread to be super nice and soft. But you do get a better rise with bread flour. Now on top of this three ounces of flour, we are going to add three tablespoons or one and a half ounces of unsalted butter. We never bake with salted butter because we don't know how much salt is in that butter. So we cannot control the final salt content of our recipe. That's why unsalted butter is always preferable to salted when it comes to baking. Now I cut them into fairly small pieces so that they will melt quickly during the next step, which is probably going to be the step that you might not have seen before. I am going to add three ounces of boiling hot water to this flour and butter. And I'll explain why here in just a second. Now, I've got a tea kettle here that's raring to go, but you can boil yours on the countertop in the microwave, whatever. Just make sure you measure carefully as you add the boiling water. It's best to do it in very small amounts and all over the bowl so that you're contacting as much of the flour as possible. All right. Now we can let that sit for just a few seconds before we stir it together. That will help melt the butter. And something fascinating is happening to the flour as this hot boiling water is sitting on it. If you've ever made gravy or pudding on the stovetop, you know that when you add any kind of starch, like flour or cornstarch, to a hot liquid, it quickly thickens as it reaches the boiling point. This is because there are little packets of starch inside the flour, and when they meet a hot liquid, they explode, sending out all these tiny little starch fibers into the matrix of whatever you're cooking. This is called gelation or gelatinization. And it's a technique that's exploited in a traditional Japanese way of bread baking called yudane. We're basically just pouring boiling water over the flour to blow out those starch molecules. This allows those starch molecules to hold on to liquid for longer periods of time. And in our final loaf of bread after baking, we've got more water inside that loaf that the loaf is holding on to thanks to that really blown out crazy gelated starch. That means our bread stays softer for longer and stales less quickly. It's a really cool technique and you can actually apply it to any bread that you want to extend the bread's shelf life. All right, now we just wanna make sure we have incorporated all of this melted butter into the paste before we move on to the rest of our liquid ingredients. So now we're going to add two ounces of sugar. Now, if you are diabetic and you're trying to limit your sugar intake, you can eliminate the sugar from this recipe. If you're a honey household, you can add one ounce of honey instead of the two ounces of sugar. And we're adding the sugar at this step because sugar is hygroscopic. It draws moisture to it and melts. So you typically add sugar along with the other liquid ingredients in most recipes. Next, we're adding three ounces of buttermilk. My regular followers know how much I preach and praise buttermilk. It is the most important ingredient in my kitchen. It's always in my refrigerator and it should always be in yours too. Buttermilk is not as high maintenance as people think it is. It lasts way beyond the expiration date. And when you're finished with it, you can make more just by refilling the bottle with milk and leaving it on the countertop for a couple of days. Now, for those of you people that are like, oh, I just add a teaspoon of vinegar to my milk to make buttermilk. That is not buttermilk. 
Real buttermilk is a naturally fermented product, which is where its acidity comes from. If you add vinegar to milk, you have vinegary milk. It does not taste pleasant, it is not good, and it is not buttermilk. So go get yourself some buttermilk before you make this recipe and watch my buttermilk video linked up here at the top because it will actually change your life in the kitchen. Buttermilk is a really cool ingredient. We are adding three ounces of it to our dough. One egg straight from my chickens. And finally, six ounces of sourdough starter. Cold, unfed, straight from the refrigerator. If you're new to my channel, we bake all of our breads with cold, unfed starter. We never discard and feed our starter. We only feed our starter when we need to make more. It's a wonderful life over here, people. So if this is a bit shocking to you, don't worry. You can bake any sourdough recipe with cold, unfed starter straight from the fridge. You just have to give it a little bit more time to ferment, that's all. And in return for that, you get more flavor. So we are adding six ounces of sourdough starter at 100% hydration. 100% hydration means every time you feed your starter, you're feeding it equal weights of flour and water. So a feeding might be 12 ounces of flour and 12 ounces of water. As long as you're feeding equal weights, your sourdough starter is at 100% hydration, unless the hydration has gotten screwed up somewhere along the line. And if this dough ends up too sticky for you to work with, this means you either mismeasured your liquid ingredients or your starter is over 100% hydration. I have a video called Troubleshooting Simple Sourdough that will help you fix your starter's hydration level if your starter is overhydrated and you end up with a dough that's too sticky to work with. That is fairly common. I get lots of comments about people saying, oh, the dough is so sticky, I couldn't work with it. That extra liquid is coming from your starter. Now, we wanna get in here with a whisk or a Danish brotpisker and get this all really well mixed together. While I love my brotpisker, I find that the whisk actually makes this particular technique happen a bit more quickly. So, we wanna just get all of that starter broken up and distributed throughout the matrix of the rest of the liquid ingredients. Yes, you could definitely do this in your stand mixer if you have one, but I try to make my videos accessible to everybody and you do not need a stand mixer to make this recipe. If you do use the stand mixer, I would use the whisk attachment rather than the paddle attachment for the first part of this mixing process and then switch to your dough hook. All right, liquid ingredients are well mixed. It's still a little bit lumpy, but not terribly, and that's perfectly fine. Now we add our dry ingredients, which consist of 12 more ounces of all-purpose flour or bread flour, and half of an ounce of salt. Now, my recipes do have a higher salt content than most traditional bread recipes. This is by intent. The salt helps strengthen the gluten network and helps us protect against overproofing. You can lower the salt to 0.3 ounces if you are on a salt-restricted diet, and the recipe will still turn out okay. You just have greater risk for overproofing your dough. All right, now I'm gonna get these stirred together. I'm starting with a fork here. And at some point, that's gonna get a little bit too hard to stir. So we're gonna to switch to our hand, unless you're using a stand mixer. Now this is technically a no-knead recipe, and while this looks like kneading, you would typically knead this dough for 15 minutes by hand. And we're not gonna do that. We're gonna let the gluten develop overnight as the bread sits. But you do need to get in there and get everything mixed together until your dough is uniform and cohesive. Gather all the dry ingredients from the side of your bowl as you're working. And as you start to get well mixed, the dough is going to become slightly stickier. That's perfectly fine. As long as you don't have any dry, crusty bits on the outside, it's mixed enough. Now, I am going to give this bowl a quick spray with some olive oil. I know some of you have a conniption when he is cooking spray, so you can just use regular oil or butter if you want. Now we're gonna cover this loaf securely with a lid that's not very air permeable. We do not want it to be completely airtight, otherwise the carbon dioxide that's being produced by the fermentation might blow the lid off. But we don't wanna use a kitchen towel or anything that's air permeable like that because this is gonna ferment for at least 12 hours. And if you use a kitchen towel, you're gonna to develop a hard crust on the outside of your loaf that's gonna prevent it from rising and you don't want that to happen. So if you don't have a lid that fits your bowl, use a pot lid or a baking sheet, some saran wrap, something like that on top of there, just to make sure you don't have a lot of air in contact with the dough. All right, this dough is going to ferment at room temperature on the countertop until it's double. 
For most of you, that's going to take about 12 hours. If you happen to be one of those people that really does feed your starter like every day, but you still wanna use this recipe, it's entirely possible that your dough will double in six to eight hours. And if that's the case, at that point, you really do wanna get it shaped and then baked. But for the vast majority of you that use the cold starter method, this should sit for 12 hours until it has doubled. Unlike my simple sourdough recipe, this dough ferments more quickly because we've got sugar and dairy and other ingredients that are providing more diverse food for the yeast and bacteria to consume. However, there's a counterpoint to this. We've added quite a bit of fat to this dough in the form of that egg yolk and the butter and the negligible amount of fat that's in the buttermilk. Fat in a rich dough prevents the gluten from linking up into really long tight chains as it does in a lean dough. This is why we call fat shortening because it shortens the chains of gluten. So while the dough will ferment faster, it will not rise quite as high because there is less gluten development to trap the carbon dioxide being produced. So we are looking at a shorter initial bulk fermentation for this dough than we do with my typical simple sourdough. I don't want you to let this dough sit around for 24 hours before you shape it. So I want you to check it at 12 hours, and at 12 hours, it's probably gonna be double, and at that time, it is time to shape. I'll see you tomorrow. After 12 hours, it is time to shape our loaf. Now, you need to choose which loaf pan you are going to bake this in. And this loaf works beautifully in your standard eight or nine inch loaf pans. You can also use the skinnier, longer loaf pans if that's more the size of the sandwiches that you'd like to make. Now, I actually like to bake this sandwich bread recipe in a Pullman loaf pan, which is enclosed on all four sides. It's got this neat little lid here that slides right on. It covers your loaf as it's rising, and when you bake it, the loaf rises and fills in this entire block so that your sandwich slices come out almost perfectly square. It's super cool. Now, I have formulated this recipe specifically in volume for my Pullman loaf pan, which is four by four by eight. If you've already got a Pullman loaf pan and it's a different size, you may need to scale this recipe up a little bit or down a little bit if you want to achieve like full square rising inside your Pullman loaf pan. If you want to get this one, it's linked in the video description below. It's certainly not necessary, but it's kind of cool to have a perfectly square loaf of bread. All right, the first thing that we're going to do is grease our pan. And yes, you can rub oil or butter in there. You can line it with parchment if you wanna waste money. I am just using an olive oil spray. And if you're using a Pullman loaf pan, you need to grease the lid as well. All right, we want to flour the surface that we're working on and your hands as well. Then we are going to gently remove the dough from the bowl. And now we wanna stretch this loaf into a fairly even rectangle that's about as wide as the long end of our bread pan. It's also a good idea to gently pat the dough down because sandwich bread does not rely on large holes as the aesthetic currently is trendy for regular sourdough bread. We don't want giant holes because where's the mayonnaise or the mustard gonna sit, right? Our ingredients are gonna fall out through the holes. So we do want to degas the loaf just a little bit, collapse those larger air bubbles so that those don't end up turning into giant holes in the middle of our dough as it's baking. All right, so we've got our dough just about the width of our loaf pan. And I like to use the King Arthur method of loaf forming. I've been using this for the last several months and I've found that it works out a little bit more nicely than just rolling the dough up. So what we're gonna do is take the top of the dough, fold it down to about two thirds of the way down the loaf, give that a nice little pat back out. And then we're gonna take the two corners here and fold them down sort of like we're making a paper airplane, right? Then we're gonna give that all a nice pat as well. Make sure it's nice and flat and even. Now we're gonna take the pointy end and begin rolling it forward, giving it a nice seal every time we roll it. We're gonna roll it forward and gently push back towards the end of the loaf. This is creating nice surface tension that's gonna help the loaf rise beautifully and we definitely want it to rise quite a bit. And when you get down to basically that original scene where you first folded the dough down, we're gonna take the corners here, fold them in just a little bit and kind of tuck them right like that. I'm gonna do another little fold and seal, and then we can take the bottom here, fold it over nice and tight, and pinch it to seal. Now it's very important that that seam be at the very bottom of your loaf pan 
once you put the loaf into the pan. All right, so we've got our nice cute little loaf here. It may end up, because the dough is fairly slack, it may end up slightly longer than the loaf pan, which is perfectly fine, because you're just gonna kind of smoosh it together as you set it into the loaf pan. All right, and now I like to just kind of press it down to even it out, and if you're using the Pullman pan, you wanna slide the lid right back on top of it. If you're using a regular loaf pan, you can cover it with a kitchen towel or some saran wrap, and you want this to rise at room temperature for about two hours. You want it to double in size, but it's not going to come all the way to the top of your loaf pan. The rest of that rise is gonna happen in the oven. Two hours later, and you can see that the loaf has doubled in volume, so now it's time to bake. I have preheated my oven to 375 degrees and put the rack in the center of the oven. And this bread is gonna bake for about 50 minutes or until the internal temperature is above 195 degrees Fahrenheit. After 50 minutes, you wanna check your bread. If you have a thermometer, that is the best way to determine whether your bread is done. You want to make sure the bread is over 195 degrees Fahrenheit, and mine is at 201. So in my case, 375 for 50 minutes was perfect. And we're going to let this cool for a couple of minutes and then take it out of its loaf pan to fully cool. So here we have our beautiful little square sandwich loaf fresh from the oven. Now do not try to slice it until it has cooled fully. That means at least two hours outside of the loaf pan at room temperature and no hint of warmth at all radiating from that loaf. Ideally, leave it on the countertop for eight hours and then it will be much easier to slice. I'll be back tomorrow to talk about slicing and storage. Alrighty, our sandwich loaf has staled for about eight hours, so now it's gonna be nice and easy to slice. Slicing sandwich bread is actually something of an art. You definitely wanna make sure you have a sharp knife. And note that I said sharp knife, not expensive knife. If you are a knife snob, it is absolutely not worth spending 60 or 70 bucks on an expensive bread knife because your bread knife is going to get dull after a year or two of continuous use. And it is very difficult to sharpen a serrated blade to the same sharpness that it came from, from the factory. So do not waste your money on expensive bread knives. I love this offset bread knife. It lets me go all the way to the bottom of the cutting board without bumping my fingers onto the cutting board or the work surface. So for me, an offset shaped bread knife is absolutely critical to getting a good slice. I buy a new one of these every couple of years. They're about 20 bucks on Amazon, and I'll put the link to this in the video description below if you wanna get my favorite bread knife. But look for a serrated bread knife with an offset handle, and you'll be good to go. Now, when you slice into your loaf, you wanna let the knife do the work. Back and forth with very little pressure and let the knife guide you towards the bottom of the cutting board. You also wanna make sure your knife is held at a perpendicular angle to the cutting board surface. It's very tempting when we're slicing bread to hold the knife at a slight angle and that will mess you up. You do not get even slices if you're cutting down at an angle. So really focus on holding the knife perpendicular to the cutting board. Now we go back and forth, nice and gentle and slow. Watch that knife angle to make sure you're not cutting inwards. And then you get your perfect slice. Now, folks, they also make a whole bunch of gadgets for slicing sandwich bread evenly. And I'm gonna tell you, I have tried a lot of them. I've tried the ones made out of plastic, the ones made out of metal, and the ones made out of wood, and I don't like any of them. I find that I can get more consistent slices by focusing and paying attention to what I'm doing and slicing the entire loaf at a time and then storing it. Not only is that more convenient for you when you just need to pull a couple of slices out of the container or the bag, but when you're slicing all at once, you can really focus and make sure you're doing everything evenly and precisely. Who needs another big bulky gadget around the house for something as simple as slicing bread, right? Just follow the pointers that I've given you and you'll be slicing perfectly in no time. Let's get a full pure slice out of this bread and see what it's like. That's a really, really lovely slice of bread. We've got wonderful sourdough smell. Mmm. It's nice and rich, very soft and tender, but still sturdy enough to where it's not going to fall apart on you like a lot of the ultra soft sandwich breads will. You definitely want this to be sturdy enough to hold all of your sandwich makings together. Mmm. Yum. That flavor is really, really wonderful. That beats the heck out of 
anything you can get at the supermarket. And thanks to that Udane method where we pulled the boiling water over the flour in the very beginning step, this bread is going to stay soft and tender for two to three days longer than an equivalent homemade loaf made without that technique. You still have to figure out how you're gonna store the bread. For my sandwich loaves, I have this little bread box that I got on Amazon. It's kind of fun because you can set the month and the day that the bread was baked on the top so that you know how long it's been there. It keeps moisture in without it suffocating the bread like it would in a plastic bag or a Ziploc bag. So I can slice all of my bread, put it in here, close it and seal it, and it can stay on the countertop for use throughout the week. Now I do have one other storage option to share with you that's fairly new to me. I've only been using it for a few weeks, but I'm absolutely in love with it. This is beeswax infused cotton fabric. And the beautiful thing about it is that it sticks to itself, but not to bread. So you can give it a fairly tight wrap. And it is only barely moisture permeable which really controls the rate at which the bread stales. It radically slows down that process, but you don't end up with a weird soggy bread like sometimes you do when the bread is in a Ziploc bag or a plastic bag. I get two, sometimes three extra days of freshness with my homemade breads when I have wrapped them in this wonderful beeswax cloth. Now, these aren't the cheapest things. They're about $15 for each cloth. However, the cloth will last you a year or more with regular use. If it gets dirty, you can simply wash it off with cool water and let it dry. And I have been super, super impressed by the performance of these beeswax cloths ever since I started using them. So I'll link to both of these little storage solutions for you in the video description below if you wanna check them out. If you enjoyed this video on simple homemade sourdough sandwich bread, please give this video a like and subscribe to my channel. I have got so much more cool stuff headed your way. As always, hit me up on my website, ultimatefoodgeek.com for free printable recipes. Please comment in the video description below, especially if you are struggling with this recipe and need some help. I try to get around to all the comments, especially those from people that need a little bit of assistance or advice. I am Ben Starr, the Ultimate Food Geek. Thanks for watching everyone and have a great day.